them filters. You can pay a little now or a lot later. Let's take a look at our starting line of the Suzuki starting grid. As the field comes down out of the trioval area, starting grid, Jeff Purvis will lead him down at 192.502 miles per hour. Beside him, veteran Dick Trickle in the car number 39, the Rulos Brothers car. Back in row two, Loyal in the pole center from Daytona. And beside him, a seven-time winner in Archer competition, veteran Jimmy Horton driving for Kenny Schrader. Row three. As Gary Bradbury making it just his fourth ever ARCA start, and beside him, another newcomer to ARCA racing, Joel White. Row four has Bob Hill and a two-time series champion, Bill Venturini. Back in row five, Mark Thompson. What an incredible flip he took in Daytona. We'll tell you about what happened with him since then. And beside him, Michael Dawkins, the guy who he came into contact with in Daytona and had that fantastic accident. Row six. Row six, we see Peter Gibbons qualifying over 188 miles an hour. Mark Stahl, Mark veteran in this series, and Frank Kimmel in row seven, along with Bob Strait. Row eight, see Bobby Gearhart and Jeff McClure. Jeff McClure just talked to Kyle Petty there a little while ago. Look for him to make a move. And in row nine, we see Kenny Allen and Bobby Bowser. Bobby, a former champion of this series. And in row number 10, Kerry Teague and Bob Shack. Back in row 11, we have Bob Rebeck, another former champion, and the coach. Jerry Glanville doesn't have anything to do, so he decided to go racing. Dave Jensen back in row 12 alongside last year's champions, Tim Steele. As we look at the rest of the cars, we see some more champions back in there, Jerry. Indeed, Benny. We got uh, six rookies starting today's field. Six rookies, five former series champions. There's Laura Lane, a young lady who's uh, trying to make a name for herself in Arca Racing, dirt track racer from Texas, Tom Lorenz. We yep. might mention, as you look at the field, a couple of drivers will be going to the back of the pack. The car number 19, Rob Smith, having to go to the back of the pack. He had an engine problem and elected to start back there. And Kerry Teague. Kerry Teague lost his engine, had to borrow an engine, and missed the driver's meeting while he was busy. Put it in the engine, has to start at the rear of the field. And there's a provisional Roger Blackstock. His father used to help me when I ran Arkham back in the 60s. Wayne and Barbara Blackstock. As we get set to go racing here at Talladega, glad to have you with us. 500 kilometers at 312 miles, 117 laps, and Jeff Purvis in a Chevrolet alongside Dick Trickle will lead this field down. 41 cars. We might mention Bobby Coyle qualified in the car number eight. He will not start. He blew his engine this morning, so only 41 cars will start this event. drivers with experience Jimmy Horton on the outside and our pole sitter Jeff Purvis with Roy Allen and the Hooters Ford right on the rear of Purvis in turn three. And Roy Allen chooses to go with Jeff Purvis gave him a little bit of a push going into turn three and move Purvis up into second place and he's got a good run he might even get by trickle before they get back to the start finish line Jerry. <laughs> at 192 the drafting they could go over 193 and first time by will be trickle the 52 year old veteran from wisconsin rapids wisconsin Boy, those cars don't want to run side by side long those two in front will get away from them in a hurry it will go away quick let me see horton and Loy allen side by side that's bill venturini a former ARCA champion on the inside, the green and white car, number 25. You can't afford to back off in a situation like that. You just hope to get a little burst of speed, whether you're on the inside or the outside, and move by the guy that you're running beside of. But that isn't happening. They're just still running side by side, and you can see the front two are pulling away. Exactly as Ned had said, with side by side racing, that front draft becomes very, very effective. If they scatter three wide in the primal area back in the pack, a couple of cars trying to make a move. And Venturini makes the pass on Roy Allen to take the position away. Let's check into the pits with John Kernan. Jerry Dick Trickle leads the field with Jeff Purvis hot on his tail. I was just talking to James Fitch, the car owner for Jeff Purvis. He said in practice yesterday they determined that the two cars ran faster. Trickle was out front. 
front. So he's loving it. James Finch is, if those cars behind are running two and three wide, he says they want to put as much distance on that second pack as they can. Well, certainly, the farther you are out in front of them, the less danger there is of getting in a wreck. But now they have singled out, John, and it looks like Jimmy Horton and Bill Venturini might be catching the two. Front two cars, and there's four cars single filed, and then this pack, as they are still too wide, that's Bob Strait in the big black car with a target on the front back there. He is in the car number 37, a Jim Spacuza on machine, 32. And that's Mark Stahl. Now six cars in the lead draft, two cars, and then it was a two-car breakaway, but the car number 52 with Jimmy Horton driving for Kenny Schrader has led that second force of, up to the lead draft. like the 11 car of Curry Teague has got more engine problems. We see him slow on the acre of the racetrack down in turns one and two. And Horton is going for that second spot alongside Purvis. That's Horton on the inside, the blue and white car. Jeff Purvis on the outside, white and red car. I think it'll depend on who Venturini picks up. I think he's going to go with Horton down on the inside, and that'll make the difference in whether they get by or not. Jimmy Horton driving the car that went to Victory Lane in Daytona. Mike Wallace was driving it in Daytona, and no, Purvis shows a lot of muscle. Jeff Purvis has a Runt Pittman engine in the car. Now, Runt Pittman builds the motors for the car number four, the Morgan McClure Winston Cup team, which won, of course, the Daytona 500. So it's very, very strong. And he shows a little bit of muscle, but Horton will take the spot away, as it is Dick Trickle, our leader, Horton in second, Purvis third, Venturini fourth, and Roy Allen showing in the fifth position. And that's Gary Bradbury in the red car running uh, right behind in sixth spot. Well, and Roy Allen backs off going in turn three. Looks like he might have a problem then. Car went a little high with him there, and he's lost. He should be able to pick that back up if he gets in line. Spoke with Dennis Connor, the crew chief on Loy Allen this morning down at the Arctic Garage. He said the concern they had was, even in the Winston Cup car, which will race here tomorrow, that these cars are set up almost alike. And in the draft, the cars tend to have a little bit of a push. You have trouble turning the car, and you saw it go very high in turns three and four just a minute ago. 112 laps to go, 117 comprised of 312 miles, or 500 kilometers, in this second stop on the $2 million Arctic Tour. Better reporting from the pits that Lloyd just got a little bit loose getting in the third corner, had to get out of the throttle, and that's the reason we saw the gap of five or six car lengths. As Purvis is working high up in the corner. Hey, wonder if his car is pushing up a little bit or if he's just driving it up there. I don't know. Now he's trying to come to the end. We'll see if it's pushing. We we'll, should be able to tell it when he goes into this turn down on the inside of Horton. Yeah, Purvis makes the move in turn one inside of Jimmy Horton. Now, once again, as Ned Sherritt pointed out, two cars side by side will normally let a car in front of them get away a little bit. But they're holding their own coming off the 33 degree bank and down this 4,000 foot back straight away. I'll tell you what, more and more cars are joining this front group. And the three abreast as Lloyd Allen goes by our pole center, Jeff Purvis. Ben Torini goes in right in front of Purvis. Jeff McClure is in there, the young man that Kyle Petty spoke with. Yeah, it is the UNLV car. Play for Jeff McClure, who started way back in 16th spot. He's made a good run. Purvis got back up in that outside line. He decided that low groove was not going to work for him. They're trying to get in line, single file, coming out of turn two. We've got one car showing a little bit of smoke. Bob Keselowski, and boy, they have, had, they have struggled all weekend, changing engines. They finally put their Joey Aarons and qualifying engine back in, and apparently it will not finish today here at Talladega. We're in the early laps of the Food World 500 on the high banks of Talladega Super Speedway. Back in a moment. Talladega, Alabama, for our Speed World coverage of the Food World 500. We might remind you fans who turned in to see Speed Week that Speed Week will directly follow our telecast of this exciting ARCA event. Bob Jenkins and all the crew there in Speed Week will be on hand to, after the conclusion of this 500-kilometer uh, event to bring you up to date on what's happened around the world in motorsports. Right now, I hope you're enjoying some exciting high bank and high speed action here at Talladega. Jeff Purvis, their pole setter, has retaken the lead. And look here, Gary Bradbury in second spot. 
And we see Jimmy Horton in third and Dick Trickle, their leader, just a couple of laps ago, all the way back to four spots. And Benny, we talked a little bit ago about uh, Jeff Mathur making a move to the front. How about Tim Steele? He started in 24th position and is now already up to 10th. So he is on the move. That's exactly what happened to Tim Steele. You see his, oh, we got a car hit the wall right in front of Steele. And he went low up in turns three and four. And one car had backed it in the wall and has slid down across the racetrack. And here are the leaders heading back to take the caution flag from Doyle Ford as he signals them and waves the caution for the first time today. As 106 laps in the books, we just commenting that Tim Steele did exactly the same thing in Daytona. As here's a car slow on the apron. That's Bob Strait. Is slow on the apron. It looks like he is slowly. He might have been involved in that accident up in turns three and four. Field now forming up behind the Pontiac safety car down the back straightaway. The incident took place in between turns three and four, and the car slid up across the racetrack and down right in front of Tim Steele. That might have been the 89 car of Jeff McClure. There's some smoke, which there we see straight spin. And is that the 89 car of McClure that spun and hit the wall? I'm I think it's sure. one of those cars that was up in the lead pack. It's, it's hard to... Now, McClure was being shown in the seventh position after starting back in 16th spot. Young man from Denver, North Carolina. Here's another look. Look at this picture right of your screen. Looks like 89 to me. Uh, 45. No, 45. 40, 49. 49. Oh, that's Joel White. Joel White out of Rose City, Texas. And uh, you know, he's working in Stanley Smith's shop. And Stanley Smith, the fellow who was involved in the action here last year in the Die Hard 500, is a spotter for him today. As we see him push the Keselowski car back to the garage area, which says, all done for the day. Once again, first caution flag today coming out involving two cars, Joel White out of Texas and Bob Strait in the car number 37. Back in a moment. Coming this Sunday, NASCAR racing and a chance to win ESPN's On the Pole contest. The winner will present the Bush Pole Award at the Brickyard 400, plus over a thousand runner-up prizes. Watch the race Sunday for details on ESPN. Sponsored by Bush Beer, Anheuser-Busch, St. Louis, Missouri. Back at Talladega, Alabama, the Food World 500, ARCA event in the early laps here. We're under caution for the first time today. Twelve laps are being shown as having been completed. We mentioned it was a warm but slightly overcast day. Temperature 80 degrees, 74% humidity, 40% chance of rain, and winds were gusting out of the northwest at 20 to 25 miles per hour. Now, those are pretty ominous looking clouds. We are told that the thunder shower should move in in the next hour and a half to two hours, so we are going to make every effort, as are the folks here at ARCA, to be able to limit the uh, caution flags to as short as possible. And Maybe get as many green flag races laps on and get this race to conclusion here at Talladega. Jeff Purvis being shown as our leader. Great run for Gary Bradbury. And one driver who's a former series champion is not going to finish today. He's standing by with our Kyle Petty. I'm, I'm here with Bob Keselowski, who just pulled into the garage area. Didn't qualify that well down here. This is only the second race into the season. What, seemed to, what happened out there? I don't know. Uh, Kyle looks like uh, the car never would get up to speed. I don't know what kind of problems we're having. It felt like it might have burned a piston. It got some uh, smoke out the pipes, and now it won't even turn over. I know it had oil pressure and everything, and it wasn't running hot, so either drop the valve or burn a piston. It never would run. That's Bob Keselowski. He's going to be in contention all year long for the championship, just like he always is. And indeed, he will be. And there's the car number 49, at least what's left of the car number 49, Joel White, the action rent to all Chevrolet. If you heard many parts to say that car being prepared in Stanley Smith's shop in Chelsea, Alabama. Under caution the first time today, Jeff Purvis, Gary Bradbury, Jimmy Hart, Dick Trickle is fourth, Loy Allen is fifth, six through ten. Bill Venturini, Jeff McClure, Mark Stahl, Tim Steele, and L.W. Miller the third. 13 laps of 117 complete. Great crowd on hand. Glad to have you with us here at Talladega Super Speedway. A warm welcome today to the MCI Proof Positive Blimp and its crew giving us these beautiful aerial shots of Talladega Super Speedway. The blimp being piloted today by Captain Matt Elkins 
out of Dallas, Texas. There's a good look at the MCI proof positive blimp hovering over today. It was a little late taking off because, as you saw, those gusting winds at 20 to 25 miles an hour and thunderstorms in the area. We've had some intermittent thunder showers all afternoon, but look at this crowd on hand for a great afternoon. Super Saturday, they call it here in Talladega. They just completed one whale of an IROC race, International Race of Champions event, and what a great show that was, and now we're enjoying 500 uh, kilometers, basically 317 miles, 312 miles, I should say, of ARCA competition. Cars are getting ready to go back green flag races, working the car, trying to clean the debris off the tires. Bob Bree back the blue and yellow car. It's our fifth place car. L. W. Miller. You might know anything about L. W. Miller. Well, he's L. W. Miller the third. He's going to be a first and second. There's a couple more of them around somewhere. <laughs> we'll see Michael Dockett right behind him in 64. That's Tim Steele. The red car, number 16. L.W. ran the dirt tracks up in New York and some of the short tracks around Pennsylvania, driving a Chevrolet Lumina. He ran the last 10 races last year, finished fifth up at Flat Rock in uh, Michigan, also Kilcare up in Zinio, Ohio, where Benny Parsons used to race in the early I years. I never raced at Kilcare. You didn't race at Kilcare? Flat Rock? Yes. You did. I, would, I ran the local races there and also the ARCA races at Flat Rock. Never went to Kilcare. Jerry, talk about short track racing and the high rock race. How about Steve Kinzer winning the high rock race here today? Is that an incredible finish? Steve Kinzer. And you don't find many better on the short track. I don't think you find any better on the short track than Stevie Kinzer. And he held off a challenge from some of the best to win that International Race of Champions. And uh, the first pure short track competitor in the IROC series, boy, Jason Norrie, and that crew have done a wonderful job to put that series together. And Kenzer hangs on to get that win just moments ago. Did you see all those guys up against the outside retaining wall trying to come down for the green flag? That's to ensure that no one got on the outside of them, all trying to protect the outside. Because the rules, you can only pass on the outside That's on the restart until you get to the start finish line. Jimmy Horton, he's got a new name on the roof of his car. Did you see that, Ned? Yeah. Slash Gordon. Had, had dinner with Jimmy last night, and he was telling me they put that handle on him. That's his motorcycle handle, I believe. Yeah, they said a motorcycle rider with all the leathers and everything couldn't just be a Jimmy. Yeah. So they named him Slash. Right. Well, he had a nickname here last year. It was called Air Horton. Remember, Air Horton got out of his place. They named Air Horton for a while, but now it's Slash. As he currently runs the third spot. Let's check in with John Kernan. Well, Jerry, as Paul Harvey would say, and now the rest of the story concerning Slash Horton. A couple of weeks ago, he's been working over at Kenny's Trading Shop. Showed up there, as you said, with his motorcycle leathers on and everything, and Kenny said, you know, Jimmy, you look like you belong in the rock band Guns N' Roses. He's that band for Slash. Kenny said, I'm going to call you Slash from now on. Well, Jimmy's grandmother over in Chattanooga, Tennessee, is watching this afternoon. And uh, Jimmy said she went to one race back when he was about 21 years old and said he had a bad wreck right in front of her, scared her to death, she never did go back to another race, but she watches us all the time on TV. Well, she's going to be awfully proud of her grandson right now. He's holding on to third spot. Now, he's won here twice at Talladega. In fact, he's the only multiple winner in the field today. Here we see Tim Steele on the inside trying to get by Mark Stahl. And, you know, I put Mark Stahl in Daytona. We talked about Mark Stahl. He had a great run going. And I said he was from Charlotte. Well, he notified me that he's moved to Hilton Head, and they work on the car in Savannah, Georgia. That's Mark Stahl in the car number 32. Had a top 10 finish in Daytona after qualifying in eighth spot. A good run down there. And we mentioned Tim Steele did the same thing in Daytona. Qualified 24th and 22nd. Look at this pack here trying to run him down. L.W. Miller is right there in the car number five behind him. The 64 car, that's Michael Dockin out of Clearwater, Florida, in only his second ever ARCA start. Looks like Ken Allen in that black and red car, right? The fourth car in line. We see Miller started 26th and now running 10th. So Bob Hill is the car number 46. He's the red car there, Ned. This group sort of got off to a slow start. They were racing side by side, and the front pack got away from them. Now that they've singled out, they might be able to pick back up on front. 10th, 11th, 12th, 13th, and 14th. What you're watching right there, the car number five, L.W. Miller. Whoa, they are dicing it up. That's Brewer 
Glenn Brewer in the car number 10 and nearly buys the wall. And Jerry Glanville may need a pacemaker after that move. He uh, stopped and jump in the brakes. And as you mentioned, Kyle Petty said the first time he drove, they put him in their mellow yellow Pontiac at Atlanta. That didn't frighten him enough. So here he is at Talladega. Welcome to the Super Speedways, Jerry. Watch this. Bob Strait, who did spin earlier and it went in and changed four tires, started at the rear of the field. And we see, oh my goodness gracious. And Strait went in the corner, backed off. And Glenn Brewer, to avoid running in the back of the 37 car, had to go to the right and right in front of Jerry Glenn. I tell you, Glenn will handle that like a veteran. Used the brake pedal, didn't make any unusual movements. I mean, he did a great job. Let's, great check, let's check in with Kyle Petty. Kyle, he had to impress you. <laughs> I tell you what, when he first got in my car at, at Atlanta, I said, go out and bring it back in one piece. <laughs> he went out and run about 30 laps and got pretty fast. So I finally I had to wave him in and get him out of the thing. But I tell you what, he's really worked hard at doing this stuff. He's come up, he's run some short tracks in the bush stuff. He wants to run the Winston Cup eventually, so he's coming up through the bush, trying to arc us so he can get in the Winston Cup. And he's doing a great job today, man. And it's a brand new race car, it's 81, and Glamble was trying to convince A.J. Foyt to drive this, this car right here at the Brickyard 400 trying to qualify the Brickyard 400. And A.J. jokingly told Glanville, this Glanville told me, they said, I don't I can't even fit in the window anymore. I'm not going to get in a race car. But, and, uh, and Dick Trickle, as we watch all this, Dick Trickle, the outside pole center, is slow down in turn one. Off the pace, tough break for Trickle. His car down on the apron. Here are the leaders up there coming out of turn two. Apparently, we, we are told he have an ignition prob problem. Is that right, John Turner? Gary Rulo, the crew chief, he says they're not really sure. They think it is an ignition problem. The car just doesn't seem to want to run. A little bit of a skip in the engine. They are talking things over in the pit right now. I'm pretty sure they're going to have, they'll have one in a spare ignition box and put the switch. How does he look on the racetrack right now? Is he still running pretty slowly? Well, very slowly down the backstretch, John. And it's exactly what happened at Daytona. He completed just 10 laps, finished 39th down there after they broke a valve in the early laps. Hopefully it's something that can get the car back on the track, but his chances of victory are gone away. And there's that group of cars that's in the second pack. They're racing for about eighth spot. I think L.W. Miller is in ninth spot right now. Yeah, they need to get in line, but they're having too much fun, aren't they? They're oh, racing yeah. side by They're racing. Yeah, that's, that's right what they're here for is a race. They, they love to run side by side, but it is costing them speed. No question about it. They, they aren't going to catch that front pack as long as they race with each other side by side back there. See Bobby Bowser back there in the red and white car. Bob Breback, the former series champion, coming all the way from his 21st starting position. Breback coming up in there. Now that's that second pack led by L.W. Miller. You heard Benny mentioned there. They're 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and on back. Now we're going to show you as they come to the trial there where the leaders are. They're heading into turn one, and there are the leaders just exiting turn one over in turn two. That's the car number one of Jeff Purvis and Gary Bradbury, former All-Pro and All-American Challenge competitor, getting just his third start in ARCA competition, making his fourth start. And there we almost the extent of the, full, the back straightaway back to this group of cars. Now, Frank Kimmel has gotten in front of the cars, and they're trying to line up, maybe they can run the leaders down. Frank Campbell, the 1992 ARCA STP Preston Rookie of the Year, tries to draft his second pack toward the front, and we'll watch and hope you will when we come back. Back at Talladega, Alabama, the lead to some two Chevrolets up front, Jeff Purvis and Gary Bradbury, as they heated up here on ESPN. And for those of you expecting Speed Week, you've got the best of both worlds coming up next. Bob Jenkins and all the staff at Speed Week will bring you up to date on racing action from around the world. And of course, right now, we're going to enjoy live flag-to-flag -flag coverage. 32nd annual event here at Talladega, the Food World 500. 500 kilometers. There's the race record. Average speed, 146.552 miles per hour. Two guys trying their best to drive away from Jimmy Horton, but Horton's having nothing to do with that. Now we've got a five-car race. Boy, Allen looks like he's in jeopardy of 
And I tell you, this pack is definitely losing ground as Tim Steele has moved back to this group of cars. Yeah, they have caught up to them now. Whether some additional cars on his bumper, Mark Stahl was running on his bumper, and sometimes three cars or more can run faster than two cars running, so I don't know if that will help them. If they stay in line, it might help them, but it doesn't look like they're going to stay in line. Well, that's right staying in line and pulling away. Now, Loy Allen beginning to lose the draft a little bit. He's back in sixth position. Let's check in with Kyle Petty. Well, Loy, like we said earlier, his car got a little bit loose when he was running up there second and third. He backed off and back to the back of the field a little bit. Loy's car has continued to get looser and looser and looser. And as you saw a minute ago, when he's running up in the pack and somebody's tucked really up under him, his car is not only loose up off the corner, it's loose getting in the corner. He showed a lot of maturity by going to the back of that pack and just riding. His car's more stable right now. He might be losing the draft, but he knows he's got a fast, car to, a fast enough car to race with him when he makes the adjustment. Did he? Kyle, I talked to Dennis Conner, the crew chief on that car, and that has been the problem when Loy raced in Winston Cup this year. The car has been too tight, and they have made some adjustments on the car to try to loosen it up some, and it looks like he's got a little bit too loose. So, now if they can just go the other direction a little bit, and find a compromise, they would be okay. And the car number 21, former series champion, Bobby Bowsher. That's the red and white car, right in the middle of the picture right there. Two former series champions, in fact, the last two champions in the series, 92 and 93 champion. Car number 21, that is Bobby Bowsher. Behind him, the 93 champion and defending race winner here at Talladega, Tim Steele. Ooh, boy, they're getting off the coast there. They argue that's Bob White in that red car down there beside of That's Kenny Allen, the three car out of Shelby, North Carolina. He's having a good run. He is having a great run. That's the on-set car. That's a satellite company. Satellite guy. Basically, you buy that. They tell you how to watch ESPN, where you watch it, and uh, enjoy your ESPN and all sports network. Side-by-side -side racing coming out of turn two. Steele and Bowser might make a pretty good combination here that they've got teamed up a couple of Fords there that, that might be able to help each other. And we mentioned Dick Trickle had been slowing down after having a great run. He led the first lap of the race from his outside front row start, but uh, we weren't sure exactly what happened with Dick Trickle, but John Kernan, what was it? Well, Jerry, the engine skipped and then it just shut off completely. He coasted into the pit. They have checked just about everything that they can check right here on pit road, and they can't find the problem. They've got spark. They've got fuel going into the carburetor. The motor turns, but they just the, the spark is not getting to the spark plugs, apparently, and the engine is not firing. So they really don't have any idea. Now it looks like they're going to go under the valve covers to check out there and see if that could possibly be the problem. But they're a little bit puzzled right now. Like that old racing story, the spark doesn't spark it, and the plugs aren't plugging, and the pistons aren't working either. <laughs> that red 66 car, Mark Thompson, a fellow who we saw flip violently in Daytona, and that green car it was there. This is a brand, another car, a different car here. I didn't think we'd ever see another race car. Did you, Nan? He's a brave soul to be back out here, but he loves it. And uh, apparently no... No problems as a result of having that accident. He's fixing it up with him. He had about six broken ribs. He had a fractured sternum, which is the breastbone. He had internal injuries. Uh, he spent a week in the hospital at Halifax in Daytona Beach, Florida. Spent about another month of trying to get healed up in Georgia. And he's changed the color of that car. No more green race cars. He's running side by side with Ken Allen in his onset Chevrolet. And right on the left doorpost of that car, the B pillar or the doorpost, it's got a little sticker that says, this side up, with an arrow pointing to the sky. <laughs> of course, he's a fighter pilot. He's accustomed to doing those pirouettes in the air, but not, uh, not when you start on the ground with four tires. He's hanging on the inside there pretty good. I am impressed, Ned. I really am. The guy's doing a great job. They're chasing this almost a half a lap separation. These front five cars, Purvis in the car number one, Bradbury in the car number 78. I would say that these guys are being smart in lining up and driving away from that second pack. But on the other hand, it might be all they can do, Ned. Purvis might be leading them around there as fast as they can go. That could very well be true, but uh, it's working for them, whatever yeah. the situation is, and they are just pulling away. They're not racing getting side by side and 
Look at just how far back in the second group it is. There we see Loy Allen. Of course, they've totally lost this draft. And look, still not in the picture. There, finally comes the second group. Now, this is Jack, or Bobby Bowser running in the seventh position. That's Jack's kid. Yes. People back here. Bowser, Tim Steele back there. Frank Kimmel, 34. Bob Bree back. He's in 10th spot. We, we talked about Mark Thompson back in 11th. Now we've got to go back to another group of race cars. So we've got three distinct groups going around this racetrack. This group is led by the 0 1 car of Bob Williams. That's the guy that the gas man at Daytona had, his, had it painted and said, Hi, Benny, to me. I find out he's a policeman from Chicago. Good person, though. Yes, it is. Bob, the truck driver himself, up uh, at, for Jones Motor Company out of Pennsylvania. Now we're going to show you two separate racing packs, and here are the leaders. And they sweep on the inside of turn two. As in the next few laps, they should be getting ready to make their first scheduled pit stop. They'll make probably two stops, possibly three today here at Talladega. We'll take a quick break and come back to Talladega Super Speedway. Stay with us. Back at Talladega, Alabama. Glad to have you with us. Kyle Petty, John Turner, Jim Parsons, Ned Jarrett, and yours truly, Jerry Punch, bringing you live action here on the high banks. Fastest stock car facility in the world, and they are enjoying it at 190 plus miles per hour, trying to catch Jeff Purvis, but they haven't had a lot of luck. They are staying single file, five of them Purvis, Bradbury, then comes Jimmy Horton, two behind him, two time series champion Bill Venturini and Jeff McClure in the top five. Finally, I thought it's finally, but eventually, <laughs> one <laughs> of these days, nevertheless, we're going to see the second group of cars. So we see that the leaders are just simply pulling away from these guys. Here is Bobby Bowser, Bob Reed back, Mark Thompson, L.W. Miller. Bobby Bowser started in 18th. Two seconds from the leader back to Bowser in this second pack. Twenty seconds. Bobby Bowser trying to make up time, but we've got pit stops coming up in another possibly eight or nine laps. So we'll wait and see. These are 355 cubic inch engines. I would guess these guys could probably go 125 miles on the tank of fuel, and the tires is not going to be a problem. So. Now, gentlemen, let's see this big pack of cars. There are about 15 cars in this pack here, and here come the leaders. Right now, there are 30 cars in the lead lap, but there's the 15 of them. If they stay out there and don't make a pit stop, they're about to go a lap down. Well, I tell you what, if the leaders catch that group of cars, we got ourselves a big mess, <laughs> Just a big mess. Hey, right. Kyle, what do you think? Are they going to pit together and try to stay together? What do you think? Well, at lap 34, the 25 car, Vin, Bill Venturini, his pit crew started getting ready. They're not going to pit until probably somewhere between 40 and 47. I talked to Kathy, his wife. She says they're going to pit with the 52 car, Jimmy Gordon. Pit strategy is so important here. You can pit early and go out and have to run by yourself, and it doesn't make any difference. You have to pit with a partner, so you've got a dance partner when you go out there. I think they'll be starting any time now, Benny. Now I see Tim Steele on the racetrack. Is Bobby Bowser also on the racetrack, on the pit road, I mean? As Steele comes, brings his car to a halt. I saw another car sitting there. Of course, it, it's nice to be able to come in together and go out together, but you hope that the other team makes as good a pit stop as you do so that you won't lose any extra time that way. And we see the change in the right sides, and they are only changed the right sides. And something was wrong with Steele. He's not going. I think they just pumped off the gas. It takes longer to put gas in than it does to change two tires. And that car service. Meanwhile, our leaders are in heavy traffic. Now look, in the, look. Here is this heavy, heavy traffic. Kyle Petty reported there was some kind of an oil leak, a fluid leak in the back of the 16 car. And look as Purvis goes by Bradbury, hanging on to him. There, he said, look, I'm going where you go. Now, Jeff Purvis, the Delta Remy car, is the white red Duval car number one, a left side of your screen. That's their leader. Trying to work his way by traffic. Boy, 
he is putting a lot of cars a lap down here in this group. Getting a nice shot from high above and our MCI proof positive blimp, those great aerial shots. Ah, Whoa! Bradbury almost got made contact with the car on the inside. And here we see Bowser and Mark Stahl heading towards pit road. Bobby Bowser in the 21 car, that red black car right behind him was Mark Stahl. Quality Farm and Fleet Ford Thunderbird, the 1992 Series champion. They're headed toward you, John Kernan. Well, Jerry, as we saw Tim Steele did a two-tire right side change only, we would expect to see most of that. In fact, one team, which will remain anonymous, you told me they're only, and there's going to a spin out on the racetrack. Bowser will take only right side tires and gas. The 84 car, and it looks like the caution is coming out, Jerry. And car number 84 of Tom Lorenz out of Red Oak, Texas, the Interstate Battery Chevrolet, has uh, looped it around, Dan, and we're going to see the car. And that was one of the cars that we just saw get left there a moment ago. It was in that big pack of cars. Now, this group of cars did not get the caution. They didn't? No. The caution came out behind them, I'm pretty sure. Now, they might slow down, but, but I looked down as they came by, and I didn't see the caution, and then just immediately the caution did come out. Well, they're certainly racing like they didn't yeah. get the caution flag, I'll tell you that. There's Tom now Lorenz, the question who's is, But then I hope that Elmo doesn't take it because if he pulls on the racetrack... No, I, I think he realizes that they did not get the call. Here comes the Purvis and Bradbury, and they are still at a full head of steam. And finally, Doyle Ford and Hank Wessel on the flag stand wave the yellow flag, and as they go by, the pace car will pull on the racetrack and save on the inside. Elmo Langley driving the safety car. And there's Ken Allen, the on-set Chevrolet. Then they got the car's flag last time and they, I think ran around. Uh, okay, because please. Elmo, he's sitting in the grass down there right now. Here's we see Jimmy Horton. Jimmy Horton, how can he go in the pits when the pace car's not on the racetrack? John Kern, what's the deal? Benny apparently ran out of gas. They're spraying the ether into the air cleaner. The car fired once. Now it finally fires again. They were telling me they thought they could go 45 laps. Right side tires going on, and they're making a chassis adjustment in the left rear as Jimmy Horton goes out. And I think the only, I think you'll have to go to the tail end of the longest line. Isn't that the rule if you pit before the pit road is open? But from where I am at the exit of pit road, I can't see if pit road is closed or not. Tough break for Jimmy Horton. We see it still it has to be close because the pace car has never is never gone on the racetrack. Right. It's still yeah. sitting out there. The pace car has to pull on the racetrack and actually come around and open up pit road at the head of the field. That's the rule. The pace car was not on the track, as you heard Benny Parsons mentioned. It had not come on because the leaders net had come by at full speed to take the caution flag. Now then, yeah. let's see if the leaders go in the pits. They probably will. Do they, they know? Open now. Let's no, it can't. Will. The pace car still hasn't. Oh, oh okay. The pace car. Okay, yeah, I see. I see what you're saying. I thought the pace car had pulled out. And he's he waving that red flag to the right of your screen with the yellow cross on it, which says, no, the pits are not open, so they cannot pit. So it'll be one lap before they can pit. So while we wait for them to make that lap and head down pit road, we'll take a quick break and come back to Talladega Super Speedway. Don't go away. Well, back at Talladega, and the action just keeps on coming. Like those hits just keep on coming. Well, here, the Precision Walls car, number 74, has spun under caution and take a while. Yes, the, the reason, he obviously had a left rear tire going down. As we get said, we promise you pit stops, and indeed, they're going to come as the safety car will lead them down. By the way, that was Danny Kelly of Deland, Florida, the car number 74 that spun under the caution flag. And as they wait for Jeff Purvis to come down pit road, finally... The pits are open. They are behind the safety car, and they will make their first pit stop of the day. Of course, their caution came out at an opportune time for all of these people who had not made a pit stop. Now they get to make it under caution. Those that stopped under green, bad timing as far as they were concerned. Tough, tough luck. And the toughest luck of all, Jeff Purvis, the fastest car here, made it to this caution flag. So try to get a, a lap back on Purvis. And we see that the 78 car Bradbury over the line we see the official tell still back up some. They did not back up. Let's check with John Kernan. John? Well, Jeff Purvis and the crew were going to pit in a couple laps anyway, so this caution comes at a very opportune time for them. It will be a four-tire change. Right side's going on. They'll come around to the left side. Let's go down to Loy Allen's pit and Kyle Petty. Loy Allen come into pit. They've changed right side tires. They've gone to the left side. Dave Jack two or three rounds of wedge in this thing. Like I said before, his car was getting looser and looser. They're using these, this pit stop during this race to bring guys in for their Winston Cup team. Had a little trouble leading the pitcher. He's starting to stall. He's pushing off, but he's back out. Benny? 
you see what happened to him? And we see Bradbury, they're still holding because his nose is over the white line. Folks, you see the white line going across the river? The official kept telling them to back the car up. They backed it up some, but they jacked the car up and changed the tires. And I don't know what the rule is, if they're go how long they're going to hold him there, Ned. I don't know, I think it's a 15-second penalty. Or it is in Winston Cup. Now they finally got him back there. Now maybe it's 15 seconds after that. What a tough break for this young man who was running so well up in second spot. Let's check in with John Kernan once again. Well, Jerry, Jerry, when they completed the four-tire change on purpose, he started to leave his pit stall. He's in the very first pit stall. And when they dropped the jack, he killed the motor. That allowed Bill Venturini to beat him out of the pits. But Purvis did pull in behind him. So it should be pretty exciting with those two guys out in the front. Indeed, Bill Venturini getting a great service. And here once again is the, all of the action. And Purvis is in the very first pit. Here's Venturini pulling out in his Chevrolet to left of your screen. He comes out, and there's the, the car number two, Loy Allen, and Purvis is the third one off pit road. And we see Jimmy Horton in the fourth car. I think that was Jeff McClure that came out in second place there. Hey, Kyle Payne, did you see what happened to Loy Allen when he made his pit stop? Yeah, he came in the pits. Everything was fine. They jacked, jacked two or three rounds of wedge. When he got ready to go, he snatched it up in first gear and didn't have his foot on the clutch. Yeah, That's how about that? Did you ever do something <laughs> like that? I, no, I, I have to admit, I've never done that, but I have dropped the clutch on it wide open and had it in reverse and backed up on the hood of the car behind me <laughs> on numerous occasions. <laughs> well, we talk about experience and how important it is. Now, what a tough break. Gary Bradbury is still being held, and now will be... In fact, they just took a lap away. Gary Bradbury, Brady Humphreys, the veteran crew chief. What a tough break for the young man from Chelsea, Alabama, running in the top two all afternoon and now goes a lap down as we're under caution for the second time today at Talladega Super Speedway. Back with more after this. Track packs are brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. Each time we watch an arc event and something happens, a car spins and backs in the wall or a car runs in the back of another, we say, boy, that fuel cell did its job, or thank God for fuel cells. Let me quickly explain what a fuel cell is. There's three parts, actually. The first part, and the most important, is the bladder. That's this piece here. It's made of Kevlar, this a Kevlar fabric. This yellow part is the Kevlar. It's rubber-coated. Now, Kevlar is impact and heat resistant. Inside this bladder goes a, a foam. This foam is very porous. It's actually only about 5% of the entire volume on the inside. All this foam does is keep, help this bladder hold its shape and so when the car uses the fuel, it doesn't suck together. All it does is help hold its shape. This is the valve that goes on top. The fuel goes in here. This is the vent. The fuel comes out of here. It goes in top. Now these balls are on the inside. This is in case the car flips over, fuel will not run out. Now all these pieces go inside this metal container on the outside. This helps the bladder hold its shape on the outside. ARCA rules dictate the cars can only hold 22 gallons of fuel. If you didn't have this, if we just had the bladder, it would blow up. You could probably put 30 gallons of fuel in here. This metal container simply helped, helped it hold its shape. All this goes on the rear of the car. Just another product to try to keep the driver safe. I tell you, fuel cells have really eliminated the risk of fire, essentially in the fuel cell area but here's a car that had a fire just moments ago in the pits and is still smoking down on pit road as the smoke billows beneath tim Steele's car the car that won here that's exactly the same car that won here last year the fuel cell protected it because the rear end apparently looked like it was on fire and if they didn't have a fuel cell that car could have uh, could have been a, a serious liability in fact the driver of that car is standing by with kyle petty yeah, I'm standing here with Tim Steele. You're, this is the car you won with before. They were talking about fuel cells. It did protect the car from catching on fire, but nothing protects those fumes from coming up in the car, and I know you had to breathe them for a few laps. Yeah, yeah, well, I was out there, you know, and started smelling some smoke inside the car about eight, ten laps before we pitted and told the guys, you know, I hope there's yellow pretty quick because I need some air and some water, you know, and um, maybe see if we could get the thing fixed under caution. We came in under the green and pitted there and didn't really have time they looked and didn't see nothing leaking too serious and thought maybe we could ride it out till the next caution and see what we could do but 
That had just started really filling the cockpit up. I was about getting sick and things on fire. I had to get out of there. <laughs> well, he's not happy about being out of the race, but he's happy to be back in fresh air, Benny. <laughs> Indeed he is, Kyle, as uh, we are under caution for the second time today. Tim Steele will not finish up today at Talladega, but we will and hope you'll stay with us. Back at Talladega, Alabama, after the second caution flag of the day. And pit stops have been completed, but because of the fact that that lead draft had left a large pack of cars just prior to the caution coming out, we now have just 11 cars on the lead lap. Both those cars we see directly behind the pace car. Mark, Mark Stahl in the black, number 32, and Bobby Bowser in the red and white, number 21. Both those cars are a lap down because of pitting on the green flag. Now, Jimmy Hort, we see him in the very rear. He did pit too early. He ran out of fuel and pitted too early, but he was just back in the pits, and they did something. It looked like they was working inside the car. John Kern, what are they doing? Well, Benny, he did. He also pitted another time, took left side tires, and they have to go to the tail end of the longest line. But the problem on this, this stop, the push-to-talk button for the radio was sticking, so they couldn't talk back and forth to Jimmy. They could hear everything he was saying, but he couldn't hear them, so they hoped that they got that little button unstuck. They went ahead and popped it off with fuel. Uh, has he been able to catch up with the pack, though? Yes, he is back okay. up at the rear of the pack, but once again, uh, he's got a tough break, and the fact there's only 11 cars in the lead lap, so theoretically, there'd be about 25 cars in the long line. It looks like they're doubling up pretty well. And Ben, as you mentioned, two of those cars that are in the lead lap are right in front of the leader, so technically, there are only nine that are in the lead, lead lap. Bill Venturini is the leader. And one car has tagged the wall on the restart right in the middle of the trioval area. That's the car number 82. It has spun around and hit the wall up in the middle of the trioval and come to rest there. That is Laura Lane out of Charlotte, North Carolina, the comic strip Ford. The Clayton Cunningham own car, and she is sitting trying to get the car refired as the field now comes off of turn two up, up to full speed. And the caution once again is being waved. And, and somebody is smoking in this bunch. And these guys are trying to get a lap back. Watch them. these guys try their best to get a lap back. Venturini on the outside, and it looks to me like Bowser and Mark Stahl might do it. And this is, this is a race for the lead. That's Jeff McClure in the 89 car trying to take the lead. 21 and 32 trying to hold on as they come to the trouble and get back in the lead lap. The UNLV car is the leader. Watch him trying to put him a lap down here at the trial and they take the caution flag and both Bowser and Mark Stahl will get back in the lead lap as we are under caution for the third time today at Talladega on the restart. Here is what happened just moments ago when they got the green flag. Watch to the right of your picture. Laura Lane. We don't know exactly why she went up and and made some contact with the wall. We'll try. You will see Jimmy Horton back in the 52 car. I don't know what happened. Maybe she didn't make contact with the wall. Maybe she just simply spun and all the smoke we see. There she is. And there's not, there has been some contact on the right front fender, looks like. Right on the edge of the right front fender, but uh, no damage to the car otherwise. Well, this was a break for Bobby Bowser and uh, the uh, car number 32 of Mark Stahl because they were, I said, technically a, a lap down. Well, now they'll be back in the lead lap, so there will be 11 cars that are in the lead lap. 11 cars in the lead lap. Caution for the third time of day, and uh, Laura Lane takes the comic strip, strip car back on the racetrack. I don't understand. We've got this big S on the hood of that car, and she's calling herself Laura Lane. She's got to call herself Lois Lane. Lois Lane. Well, it's actually Laura Lane. And we got our own Superman down there. Kyle Petty, what happened to her? From the pit, what they say happened was on the restart, they started off, they all run up. This happens all the time. They run up on each other real quick. Car in front of them slammed on brakes. It's a chain reaction. She slammed on brakes, got hit a little bit from the rear, and just spun around. There was nothing she said she could do about it. She's going to come back in again right now. Benny? Okay, but she'll probably come back in and change tires. And while she does that, we'll, uh, Jerry can take us to break. Well, that 29-year-old Laura Lane, their first time here at Talladega, and we will indeed take this break under caution once again here at Talladega Super Speedway. Don't you dare go away. Back in Talladega, that's the left front tire that came off of Laura Louise Lane's car, the young lady who uh, 
had trouble just a moment ago on the restart, and that's going to be hard for anybody to drive a race car with a tire like that on it. Yeah, it's going to be hard to pick up, too. You see, no one wants to pick the tire, but so on. Hey, Kyle, what happened to the left front? It was the left front and the left rear. When she spun the car, the tires went flat. The left side tires went flat. She had to ride all the way back around the racetrack and get called back up. This is what these radials do. The sidewalls come out of them in different places. You can see it's just about. That's the way the radials are put together. And you can see they're just the same amount apart all the way around. Hey, that's what happens. You can't run on flat tires anywhere, Benny. <laughs> all right, green flag. We're back racing again. In a minute. Definitely the interliner kept the interliner the tire inside a tire, which you've seen us do on track back, which kept the car off the ground and allowed her to get back to the pit road. But Jeff McClure leads them down as the leader. Back to green flag racing once again at Talladega. 52 laps complete, 117 comprise this 500 kilometer race here at the world's fastest stock car facility. Vince Rainey can't get his car going. No, he was slow on the other start. Jeff McClure got around him. Here's Jeff Purvis going to make it three deep. He's going for second place. But Venturini in the green and white. Is that blue and white or green and white up there on the outside? Anyway, it's a two color car. Sort of teal and white. I think okay. it's sort of a combination. Sort of okay. But that 33 car of Harris Devane is right in the middle of the sandwich. Harris, the one on the right. Back up. Back up. Mm. Oh, man. We're still three abreast. Boy, out on the outside, Jeff Purvis. Now, Breback surely is not going to try to make it four abreast. No. And, and Venturini got himself a run and went up there and took the lead. He just came out of that pack and went up and passed Jeff McClure. Took the lead while these cars run three abreast. And Harris Devane is just having the time. And, whoa, his life and almost takes out Molly Allen in the car number two. The one car of Purvis on the inside, the two car of Molly Allen on the outside. And the car number 33 is only a lap down in 12th spot. He's trying to hang right there and get his lap back. I tell you, that's a wreck fix to happen. <laughs> just waiting to happen. <laughs> just looking for a place. Yep, that's right. Oh, man. <laughs> it was a simple pass up front. Phil Venturini going by and taking the lead. But this right here is the battle. And as you heard Ned say, this is where the action could very easily happen in any moment. Well, they've, they've sort of gotten... Uh, separated a little bit there now it still was pretty pretty heavy they're going to put jeff purvis in the middle here now no he he knows better than that he backed out and got down on the inside he's not going to get himself in that position and i guess the three car kenny allen has been black flag exactly why is bob hill in the 46 car that was a car that blew by jeff purvis Schedule stop at the early stop because they ran out of fuel. In case you don't have much choice to run out of fuel, you better stop. You're going to stop somewhere. Best on pit road, so they That's put him at the tail end of the lead of the longest line. He's back on board. Well, what a great show in Talladega. Thoroughly enjoy the racing action. The fans, great crowd on hand today. Glad you're enjoying it. We are, too. Take a look at our AutoZone race summary. Bill Venturini, currently our leader, has led seven of the 53 completed laps. There have been six lead changes among five different cars. There are 10 cars currently on the lead lap. Two caution flags for 52 laps. The average speed, 136.588 miles per hour. You know, Ned, we lap talked leaders. about... I'm sorry. Give me one second, Benny. Lap leaders, Purvis, Venturini, Dick Trickle, Jeff McClure, and Jimmy Horton. They are the people who have led this race. And out of race, Bobby Coyle did not start with an engine problem. Terry Teague had engine problems early on. You, you heard Bob Keselowski, Joel Wyatt had a problem. Bob Shack and Tim Steele, who you heard Kyle Petty talk with moments ago. And Dick Trickle, earlier in the event, one of our early leaders, is now part of it. You know, Ned, we talked about at the top of the show how much better the ARCA drivers are getting here on the big tracks. And you know that what we saw just a moment ago, three years ago, that would have been a huge oh, yeah. crash. Yeah. But they handled that beautifully, those guys. They really did. Yeah, that, that was impressive. I was holding my breath because I thought something big was about to happen. Then we see Purvis and Loy out the front with three of that group of cars. And there comes Horton. Lead two cars, the left of your screen, Venturini and McClure. It comes Purvis and Allen Horton. They're in the top five. And Green is my neighbor. He lives about a half mile from me in Concord, North Carolina. We're watching the middle car, the car. That's Bobby Bowers with the red and white car. 
trying to point him out and back to the lead. Purvis trying to take the lead going down towards turn one. He has Loy Allen right on his bumper. Loy in the Hooters car number two. And now Loy goes up in the outside group, but here comes Horton down to maybe give an assist to Purvis, but if yeah, not right. assisted, he might just pass him. <laughs> and Horton takes it all the way down on the inside. They are three wide down this 4,000 foot back straight away in turn three. And the car number five going right with them. That is L.W. Miller. He is also on the lead lap as they are battling up front. Six cars. Coming at you at over 190 miles per hour. Venturini, McClure, Horton, Nichols, Miller, Allen, and Purvis squeezing now back in the sixth position. Yeah, he went from uh, trying to take the lead back to six. Doesn't take much when they get a run on you. caution flag he and Mark Stone able to get up to the laps back and, and the reason they have gotten the lap down they have made green flag pit stops just before that caution came out so and there's Gary Bradbury that red car right behind Bowser the fellow who made the pit stop ran second the race, made the pit stop and was penalized one lap for not backing up on the line back up front actually oh, no. yeah, in contact with the wall Heavy contact that looks to be the car. Jeff Step McClure has been involved in that incident. As a car has it came together, that was L.W. Miller in the car number five, the short track ace from Pennsylvania and New York. What a great run he was having. He gets jammed up against the outside wall. Also collects Jeff McClure. Here's Vincent in car number 25 and Jimmy Horton, as they will be shown as the lead twosome along with them should be Loy Allen and Jeff Purvis as those four cars will lead them back to the caution flag. Heavy contact just past the start-finish line, entering turn one, and those cars have come to rest. Now McClure gets his car fired down on the grass in turn one as here comes Venturini and Horton down to take the caution flag, and they see the lights and the flagman waving, realizing there are cars just sitting on the apron, and one car up against the outside retaining wall down in turn one. That's L.W. Miller. And we see the track worker there. Let's watch this. We see McClure on the inside, L.W. Miller on the outside, and Miller goes up, hits the wall, and comes down and catches McClure. And there's the roof flaps. You can see once McClure's car got backwards, that roof flap came up, did his job, kept the car down. Different angle here, once again, looking at it from a high camera up in turn one. Here's what happened. Look at Loy Allen's move just to get by on the inside. But McClure, not quite as lucky. The car gets backwards. Those roof flaps come up, keep the car on the ground, do exactly as they were designed to do. And probably, I think, one of the best engineering inventions we've seen in stock car racing in a lot of years to make this sport even safer than it already is. And starting in August, NASCAR will make them mandatory on all tracks in Winston Cup racing that nope. are a mile or longer. That's two of the bravest people I've ever seen in my life. Cars going by them 150 miles an hour, and they're out there trying to aid the driver. And we say they put a cable. What are they doing there with that cable? Are they trying to keep the car from Trying to keep the car from moving so they can get the driver out. They want to make sure they've anchored the car and the car is in a stable position before letting the driver get out of the car. And that's a very, it's another move for state. In fact, a lot of crews at racetracks practice extricating drivers from cars. They put a car up on the banking, and here at Talladega, one of the best crews in the business, you see they've got that car anchored, and they get the young man, 20 years of age, L.W. Miller, in the car number five. Uh, and they're putting a rescue worker in the car to drive it. Have you ever seen that before, Nan? No. I haven't either. No. They're going to get the driver out and get him in to get him checked out at the infill care center. The blimp is looking for a wreck. There he finds one. Same wreck we saw a moment ago, Ned. Yep. Miller just got into the wall and rocked back down into McClure. You see Jeff finally come to stop with both. And there's another car that did spin. I don't think he made any contact. 
and nearly gets collected but the car loops around once again and comes to rest down on the grassy apron good shot from Cliff because we hadn't seen that before. And here's the running Rebels Chevrolet and what's left of running Reb and the running Reb mascot is down there in McClure's pits but I believe that that fast break is over with as the crew takes a look at that car and what's left of it. John Turner is standing by. Jerry Jeff who shut the engine down is you can well see a lot of damage to the right front. Now they'll look underneath the car and it looks as though uh, their day is going to be over because that right front of that car is pushed over about a foot and a half it looks like. A tough day for Jeff McClure. We mentioned he had Florida State on his car at Daytona. He'll have the University of Florida on at Pensacola next week. He'll have Penn State on the car at Pocono. And when you see there's the running Reb right there. He's not a happy camper right now, are you, running Reb? That car sitting on pit road. Hey, one of those days, huh? Single elimination tournament here in racing. Once you hit the wall, you're out of it. But we're not. We'll be back with more from Talladega after this. Introducing NASCAR, a celebration of automotive function and form. Exceptional handling for a ride you won't forget in traffic or on the open road. Experience NASCAR for yourself tomorrow. It's the Winston Select 500 at 1.30 p.m. Only on ESPN. Find out why NASCAR is your car. Back at Talladega, Alabama, under caution once again. And there's the car number zero two, our Sears diehard driver profile today. Belongs to that young man, 32 years old today, Frank Kimmel, out of Jeffersonville, Indiana, the Grammar Industries Oldsmobile, the 1992 ARCA Rookie of the Year. Fifth in ARCA points in both 92 and 93. Now, he comes from a racing family. Father Bill raced a lot, and I'm sure you've learned a lot over the years. Well, I know this restrictor freight racing is really tough, but... Uh... Not, yeah, you, you learn every time you go on the racetrack, you, and you've got real good racers out here, and, and I enjoy running with Purvis and, and guys like that because they're the best in this class, and uh, so you go out and try to be able to run with those guys, and, and you learn each lap on the racetrack, and, and especially on these big tracks because drafting is so important, and that takes experience, and that's what we're here to get. He is one of seven kids, uh, children. Bill Kimmel, his dad, raced back in the early 60s with Benny Parsons, of course, and the time uh, retired uh, in 78. Late 60s, not oh, early 60s, okay. late 60s. Late thank 60s. You very much. Well, there's a good look at the fifth place competitor. Now, Jeff McClure has climbed out of his car, and unfortunately, his day is over. Right, John Kernan? Jerry, Jeff just asked his crew if they might be able to get the car fixed so he could run a few more laps, but they pulled the tow truck up. It looks like they're going to haul it back to the garage area. Jeff getting himself a nice cold drink. Are you okay, Jeff? Yeah, I'm fine. It's my little old race car. It's hurting my feelings. It's hurting. You know, I was just sitting there riding, just trying to stay out of trouble. And even under caution, I got hit on the back stretch. Somebody got me over there, and a boy got me off of two, three down here, whatever it is. And it's just wild, man. It, it ain't no sense in racing that hard that long. You know, I was patient enough to sit there behind Venturini and all them guys, but I just hate it for all my boys here, man, they worked so hard to give me a good car this weekend. UNLV and Goodyear Tires and just everybody, man. r &E Radios, everybody's done me a great job. We had a car that could have won the race. And this is probably the first time in my life I ever sat there being patient and this happened. So maybe I ought to think about sitting there riding and just go on next time. <laughs> All right, Jeff McClure and, uh, yep, here we have the running Reb. And uh, I guess a little disappointed, huh? I guess he can, he's, he's at a loss for words right now, as you might imagine. Coming all the way from Las Vegas right out here. How have you enjoyed stock car racing so far? Good. All right. Well, there you have the official word. He's speechless. He enjoys stock car racing so much. The running rebel is speechless. <laughs> and John, at Michigan, that car will be painted like a Wolverine helmet, a Michigan helmet. So all the folks who watch us at Michigan up there for the ARCA race in June, which we'll have on ESPN, that car will be like a Wolverine helmet. He'll have the North Carolina State Wolfpack on the car for one of the races in the Carolinas, and he'll have Penn State on it for Pocono. So uh, hopefully better days ahead for Jeff McClure. Back with more from Talladega after this. Back at Talladega, Alabama, under caution here. And once again, we talked about what happened up in turn one. Jeff McClure just talking with John Kern and his car is the number 89. And watch L.W. Miller slam the wall and McClure right there to get turned sideways and end his day in hopes for victory. Ned, very fortunate that McClure did not go tumbling down the racetrack. He was at a perfect angle to start flipping wildly down. 
my brother Phil, remember that terrible mm -hmm. crash he had here? That's basically how his crash started. Mm -hmm. Again, Pontiac. I think those uh, those flaps on the roof flaps helped in that situation. And pace cars off the racetrack. It looks like we're just about ready to go green as Bill Venturini, the line on the outside, the lead line, cars on the inside, cars are lapped down, and green flag waves. We're back racing again. Lap 66 of 117, which make up this 500-kilometer event. Bill Venturini trying to pick up his first win in a couple of years. There were 11 different winners last year. Venturini was not among those. Wow! Look at that move on the outside. No room. Frank Gill made himself a spot. Frank Kimmel being shown in fifth position was our Sears Hard driver profile. Pretty good run for Bobby Voucher in the car number 21 who made up a lap. Well, the caution flight that came out, uh, the previous caution flight that came out, made up a lap here at the start finish line. Probably now being shown in the sixth position, one of eight cars in the lap. we the 32 car. Mark Stahl, the black car on the inside with the yellow hood, alongside the black car with the red hood. That's Bob Strait. Fifty-one laps to go here at Talladega. Let's check in with John Kern. Well, Jerry, as you mentioned, it's uh, Frank Kimmel's birthday, and that car may look a little bit familiar. It's a different page out there. Remember this one uh, in the Winston Cup race back in 1991? Harry Gant and Rick Bass, that little tandem, a uh, little gas gate, if you will, on the final laps of the Winston 500. That is the same car that Harry Gant won the Winston 500 with here back in 1991, an AED engine. Frank Kimmel says this year with his restricted plate engine, he's able to spend a little more money, and he feels very confident he possibly could walk away with his first win right here today. Got a good shot at it right now, being shown back in the fifth position following Venturini, Horton, and Loyala. Those are the front three cars. Then comes Purvis, Kimmel, the car John was talking about, and of course the car number 21 in sixth position. That is Bobby Bauscher. Eight cars in the lead lap. Mark Thompson and the car of Hill, also on the lead lap, car number 46, Bob Hill of Story City, Iowa. You can see there are two cars that are one lap down, and then we get into those that are two or more laps down. It's Jerry Glanville among those. This is the best I've seen good three in the last couple of years, Ned. You see, run good. Yeah. Having a very good run. I think it's really, really going to try to make a con some trade to death for towards trying to win the championship this year. car number 46 that's on the lead lap last car on the lead lap might be able to make it all the way on fuel which uh, the other cars were making it less than 45 laps and that would be a stretch and I guarantee you they'll be checking some fuel cells on Bob Hill's car but he started seventh currently in eighth position and not let on that but uh, word from the pits is that he might be able to make it all the way on that Clement uh, sponsored car that. There comes Loy Allen trying to let's see, who's passing who, Ned? Well, I don't know. I thought he was trying to pass Horton, but here comes Purvis down on the inside. Makes it three deep going into turn one. And Allen will back off. And looks like Jeff Purvis is the winner of that exchange. Yep. He came out in second place. Watch the battle here for fourth and fifth. Third and fourth, I should say. Horton currently holding first position in the 52 car. On the inside now, two car draft. That may help Roy Allen a little bit now that Bowser has pulled up behind him. But I believe Roy Allen's car is still a little loose. Yeah. He, he, that car wiggled a little bit going into the turn. And here at Talladega, Stephen wiggles a little bit. You got some problems. And he definitely does not want to go into the car on the outside of him. He's shied away from doing that all day long. Those red cars back there are Mark Thompson and Gary Bradbury. Both those cars lap down. Mm -hmm. Oh, Bradbury, yes, uh, Thompson. Thompson, Thompson. Still in 
Single foul up front. Bill Venturini holds the all-time qualifying record in racetrack, 205.432 miles per hour. He set back in 87. For the, the plates. For the Arca cars. For the Arca cars. Remember, Elliott was over 212 miles per hour. Here's the car number 21, Bowsher. Has finished second here, but never won at Talladega, the 1992 Series champion, right on the inside of Roy Allen, as they dice it up for the fourth spot. I think he sensed that Allen's car was a little bit loose. We saw the uh, that Purvis went down on the inside, and Allen was not contesting down there, would not go with him, because his car, as Benny said, he just don't, doesn't want to get down underneath someone side there right now and I think that's where he wants to ride with that car being a little bit loose. Let's see Mark Thompson's now pulled up behind Allen. Now he decides to go with Bowser and look what it does for Bowser. Just pushes him right on out front. Didn't take but just a little bit. Got down there and uh, gave him a little bit of didn't actually touch him but uh, that's what the draft does for you. We heard Kyle Petty mention that the two car was very very loose. Kyle has it gotten any worse? No, I tell you what, they came in, they put some wedge in the car, they adjusted the car, the car's really driving good, according to Dennis Conner. He says right now that Lloyd's out there running, getting an education, getting ready for tomorrow's race, trying to see what the car does on the outside, trying to see what the car does on the inside. This car and his Winston Cup car are pretty uh, much identical, man. Okay. Well, the uh, Big E, experience, or as uh, Felix Tomorrow's would call it, experience. Uh, trying to get to uh, learn a little bit about racing. Watch this. We're talking about some experience here. Three wide down out of the back stretch, down the back straight away as they are at 190 miles an hour. Nice to get up back there. Bob Strait in car number 37. Mark Stahl in the 32. Pretty good run for the car number 33. These cars are a lack down, but a good run, good effort. There's the name of the red number 33 car. Bob Breeback is leading that group in the red and yellow car. She's straight on the side. Reback being shown in the 10th position. And the leaders are way back over, headed down the back straightaway. 4,000 feet as Venturini, Jimmy Horton, and Ben Turner. Three Chevrolet lead the way here in the Food World 500. 44 laps remain. Can Venturini go to victory lane here at Talladega for the first time? We'll find out in just a moment. Back at Talladega, Alabama, 75 laps being completed here as our ESPN Speed World coverage continues with the Food World 500. Now, the big question mark is going to be fuel mileage. Remember Daytona? Sterling Marlin won the Daytona 500 on fuel mileage if able to outlast some of the other competitors. The questions are, as we see him dice it up now for second spot, and Purvis falls back in line into car number one behind Horton and Venturini. But, Benny, the question is, the leader may not be able to make it uh, another 10 laps or so. Well, the question I got right now is, is Venturini slowing down because they had a three-car breakaway when we went to commercial. We come back from commercial, and Bobby Bowser and those cars behind him caught the leaders. So, Venturini, Purvis... And Jimmy Horton evidently slowed down just a little bit to allow these cars to catch up. Maybe Ben Torini was trying to let someone else get in front of them so he could follow them and try to save some fuel mileage. As we're watching another race, back over the corner, on the right-hand corner of the screen, that's the 46 car. That's Bob Hill. Now, he stopped and topped off on that last crossing flag. They're speculating from the pits that they can go all the way on fuel, but he's going to have to draft somebody if he's going to be able to make it the rest of the way on fuel. Well, Bob, Bob Hill has a Richard Childress motor in it, and remember, that's the, the owner for Dale Earnhardt, and they spent a lot of time working on fuel mileage, and that's Finney Clendenin and Richard Childress engine in that red car you see in the insert of your screen. He was the last car on the lead lap. They think he can make it all the way. Man, what a reach that would be for them. But if they can do it, if we stay caution-free, that will probably put that car in victory lane. And some of our spotters are saying that Venturini can only go to lap 82. I mean, 
John Kerner, what's going on down there as far as the gas strategy is concerned? Benny, uh, three of the leaders that are down here on my end of pit road, uh, Bobby Bowser can go the farthest distance. That would be lap 92. I just talked to Timmy Cahoot on Jimmy Horton's car. He's planning on pitting about lap 82, and they have discussed it with Venturini's team about pitting together. Purvis could go an additional six laps. At least that's what we're being told down here on pit road. The longest that I've got, Bowser at 92 laps. I don't have anyone on my end who thinks they can make it the rest of the way. I mean, 92 left to 117 left. That's uh, <laughs> that's a big difference. Big, big difference. Right, Kimmel in the car, 02, trying to make a run, and Kimmel looks like he's going to get serious here, but you get a nice shot from high above. The MCI blimp giving us those wonderful aerial shots as this lead draft. That's. We see our last lap average speed, 192.370 miles per hour. That's just about what the qualifying Jeff Purvis qualified for the pole. As a matter of fact, Purvis ran 192.5, so just a little bit slower than the pole run. And look at Bowser, has worked himself up to the second spot. And I know Jack Bowser has to be thrilled to death. Well, I'll tell you, he's racing, look. He is. This is by far Bowser's best run on the big tracks, Daytona and Talladega. Bobby Bowser told me yesterday in the garage that he never named his race cars, but decided he would name this one Brittany after his three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, hoping to change his luck, and it just may have worked here at Talladega. As he's having a great run. And talking about side-by-side -side action, they're in turn three, and who's going to make it through? Lloyd Allen on the inside, Purvis up high, and right behind him, Ned Jarrett uh, Horton is right there with a host of cars. Yes, he is. He got caught up on the outside a little while ago. Now he's down on the inside, and he's without a partner again down there. He got without a partner on the outside. He thought he'd follow the perp I mean, the uh, car number two through, but it didn't stay at down there long. Now Purvis gets down there and a, goes with Bowser. A lead change. Bobby Bowser has taken the lead, and he got Venturini off the throttle. And see what happens? You call him just back off the throttle a little bit. You go back to about fifth spot. We are told that Torino may be coming down pit road here very shortly. He has backed off and has gotten those cars off of his tail. Apparently, it is the pit window as he now comes out of the screen. There is Bobby Bauscher, the 1992 ARCA Supercar Series National Champion. And Venturini is coming in the pits with no one coming in with him then. He better hope and pray when he goes back on the racetrack. He ends up with someone who can run decently. He will be long ways behind making a pit stop all by himself oh yeah he'll lose a second to lap out there just running by himself and we understand that maybe horton was supposed to come with him kyle what's going on down there Venturini had, they had been in contact with horton pit they wanted to go to lap 82 83 84. they then they decided they were going to stretch it five laps horton said or Venturini said there's no way we can stretch it five laps we've got to come in in this pit window so he was stuck coming in by himself horton is trying to stretch it They've changed right side tires. They've moved around to the left side tires. It's just like Benny and, and, and Ned said. If he goes back out here by himself and doesn't have a dance partner when he gets back out there, they're going to check out on him by a second more lap. 28.9 seconds, and he nearly collects one car coming down pit road to car number 93. That's Wayne Larson. There are the leaders coming by. He loses at least one lap in the pits as they are yet to make their pit stop, and Purvis gets a little wiggly up high, trying to go around Frank Kimmel. That is for the second position. They are right behind the car number 21, 27-year-old Bobby Bowser, our leader, as the field, the lead draft. Now we're going to watch to see if possibly Horton and some of the other cars decide to make a pit stop in the next couple laps. totally surprised that they would need to come in this early. I didn't mark down when they were in the last time, but I thought they could go over it to pass the 100 lap mark, but uh, the guys in the come in lap 82. And, and Jimmy right Horn's coming in. Okay. Right on schedule, we are told uh, apparently the 55 degree spoiler, that big spoiler requires a lot of fuel. They have to burn it. They have an open intake on these cars, and there is Jimmy Horton for Kenny Schrader on Chevrolet headed for Pitt Road and John Turner. Well, Jerry, they had come down and tried to get something worked out. Venturini's team did, but they weren't quite ready here. They wanted to stretch it to 82 to 84 laps. Jimmy slashed
Torton is in. They'll put right side tires. First can of gasoline going in. Henry Midfield from Bill Elliott's crew with his next can of gasoline. Right side tires are James getting every drop of glass. 14 even the leaders exiting turn three. That's about half the time it took Venturini's pit stop on a little over 28 seconds. Yeah, he's going to be way out in front of Venturini even when he gets his uh, speed up. Now, the 21 car, is he coming into the pits? Bowser? Bobby Bowsher will come down, and brother Gary Bowsher will go to work on our lead car, the quality farm and fleet Ford Thunderbird, trying to get his first victory ever at Talladega as he's finished second here a couple of years ago and brings it down pit road very deliberately and heads for our John Turner. Jerry, we would have been expecting him to stay out just a little bit longer. They're not going to change tires. They'll clean the grill. It's going to be gasoline only for Bobby Bowser, a former champion here. It's the one drink goes cup goes flying out. Also, the three league leaders are now in turn three. And the second can of gas going in. Bowser sitting patiently on pit road gives the okay as he heads down pit road. And the leaders come out of turn four. 15.3 seconds for Bowser. Thus far, Timmy Cohut and the Ken Schrader crew. All the leaders are coming in the pits. All of them. Here comes Purvis. And Lloyd Allen, that other car, the red car, Gary Bradbury, he is a lap down to these two cars. They are pitted together. That's great strategy, Ned. Yes. Frank Kimball stayed out there. Let's go to the pits and call Penny. Well, Lloyd Allen's just coming to pits. They're changing. They look like they're just going to change right side and, and do two cans of gas. We've seen three different pit test strategies. Venturini changed four. Horton changed two, and Bowser changed nothing. So, John, what, what does it look like down here? Well, I mean, Jeff Irvin's just pitted gasoline only, and they also, guys, when it comes by, look on the right side of the car. They were taping up something on the lower right door panel on his car. Can't see anything, John, as the car goes by. And here comes, is this 02 Frank Kimmel coming down pit road now? Yep, I think it is. And Jimmy Horton is going to be the guy that's going to be way out in front when this, all of these pit stops are over. Great pit stop by Horton. There is Frank Kimmel in the car number 02 getting the Indiana Steel Company and Grammar Industries car. They had fuel, no tire change. Remember, Purvis didn't change tires. Neither did Bowser, you heard Kyle Petty say. Either one of those, and either did uh, the car number zero two of Frank Campbell as he heads down pit road. Now, right now, I guess that Mark Thompson in six six car is leading the race because he has not stopped yet. Yep. And they say the 46 car might not have to stop. That's uh, Bob Hill. I'm gonna believe that when I see it. Yeah, I, I'll <laughs> agree with that. I can. We'll find out. But right now, Mark Thompson. That's the red and white car right there. It's being shown as our leader here at Talladega. Back with four after this. Stay with me. <laughs> 88 laps complete here at Talladega. Mark Thompson, our leader. Bob Hill in second spot. Jimmy Horton now. That great pit stop back up to third. Jeff Purvis is fourth. And Frank Kimmel rounding out the top five. Lots of racing action to come your way tomorrow. Yes. Right here at 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time, live from Talladega, Alabama, the Winston Select 500. And defending champion Ernie Irvin. Can Ernie Irvin win it for the second year in a row? And he will start from the pole position in the Texaco Havilland Fort Thunderbird. Our leader is on pit road, and that is the Mark Thompson car. They top it off in field. That puts the car number 46 out front. Now, we have been told from their pit that they can run all the way, but that's going to be a reach, I got to believe. A real reach. There he goes. And, you know, the worst part about it is that he really isn't running the line like he's trying to go the rest of the way. Kyle, what do you think? Can this guy make it the rest of the way? No way. They have recalculated here. Uh, they're, they're doing elementary math. I don't know what they're doing. Now they've decided they can only go to somewhere between 98 laps and 105. So a minute ago, we had them going all the way. Now they've got a seven-lap window that they think they're going to run out of gas in. Well, Bob Jenkins is not here, Kyle. Maybe he's down there doing their math for him. Got to be, or else they borrowed Bob's calculator, Benny. But I didn't believe that. And I would love to see Bob Hill be able to make it and get a win here. And it's uh, just a few starts in Archer competition. But I don't believe it's going to happen. They're going to have to make a big stop, as you heard Kyle say, somewhere before lap 105. Well, right now, he's about a half a lap ahead of Jimmy Horton and Jeff Purvis, who are running bumper to bumper in second and third. And I saw the O2 car just a moment ago get black flag Frank Kimmel. The 
young man out of Indiana who was running so well. And I don't know if he, uh, he did the black flag or not, but I guess that he was pitting to was going too fast on pit road, had to come back in. I'm told he did eat the, pit, the black flag, so he's probably a lap down now. And we'll take a look at the interval back to our second and third place cars, Jimmy Horton and Jeff Purvis. There they come from Triumph right there. Horton in the AC Delco car owned by Kenny Strader. Great pit stop by Timmy Kohus and the crew. Mark Reno and company not even changing tires with Delco Remy car of Jeff Purvis in car number one. They are being shown in second and third position. When they came out of the pit, Horton was about uh, three seconds ahead of Purvis. Purvis had the benefit of a lap car that they drafted together with and caught Horton. And so now they're, they're running second and third. About half a lap behind the leader. And I would guess that the 46 car is planning on uh, a gas and go. He probably will not change tires trying to keep up in front as much as he can. But I don't think that he can stop and uh, maintain the lead. Do you need No, I don't think so. The slowdown time, getting into the pits and then getting back up to speed again is tremendous here, even if he makes it you know, like a seven or eight second pit stop. That slowdown and getting back up to speed is what will cost him. Yeah. You're right. Probably the time he gets stopped, these guys will go by and there. Yeah. We'll see. There's the car number 46. Car number 46, running up front, Bob Hill out of Story City, Iowa, 39-year-old driver, finished fourth in Atlanta last November, only his fourth ever ARCA start, and the young man has never seen this racetrack except on television. In blue cars, Peter Gibbons right in front of Bob Hill. Now let's go back. That's the leader of the race. We'll try to find our second-place car. And here he comes off turn four. That's Jimmy Horton. Some of the guys in the pits are concerned that the one car, Jeff Purvis, who you see there in the red and white car, concerned that they might not put enough fuel in the car for him to, to be able to finish the race. But they have a good many laps to go, so they needed to get it almost full. I noticed most of those cars were out there putting both cans in and waiting until the car the came out the vent pipe for the overflow to make sure it was full. I know Bowser stayed in there long enough to do that. Go to our field summary. You pick out where your favorite driver is. Of course, see the drivers that are out of the race already. Jeff McClure had a great run going early on. It was involved in an incident with L.W. Miller and buying for a lead position in turn one just a few laps back. He has since parked that car. Second and third place cars with 23 laps to go here at Talladega Super Speedway. Jimmy Horton looking to win his third one at Talladega. And Jeff Purvis, although he has run so well here for years, has yet to go to victory lane. A couple of second place finishes for Purvis here, a third, a fourth, and a fifth. And yet to win. And Jerry, these cars, second and third, are about five seconds ahead of Roy Allen, who is currently shown in the fourth position. And then Bobby Bowser is a long, long way behind the car number two. Laps are winding down at Talladega Super Speedway, and this the 32nd annual Food World 500. Back with more from Talladega after this. Hope you can join us tomorrow following the Winston Select 500 from Talladega. This lithograph and many other items will be available to you while I talk shop with whoever happens to swing by the studio. Might just be this guy right here, Jeff Gordon. Join us to find out tomorrow. And Jeff Gordon, in fact, last driver to qualify for the Winston Select 500. He will start back in 40th position tomorrow, so he could make it interesting tomorrow coming from the back of the pack. The third car in line, the red car, Bob Hill, is the leader of the race. We see Peter Gibbons and Bob Breback right in front of them. These cars lap down to the leader. Well, they're, yeah, they're right in front of the leader, yeah. so they are being shown as in the lead lap. So apparently they have not made a pit stop either. So we're showing nine cars on the lead lap. A moment ago that Bobby Bowser was uh, far behind Loy Allen. That's not correct. He's only about three seconds behind Bobby Bowser, but the car number two of Loy Allen was about five seconds behind. He now is about seven seconds the two cars that are second or third, which are the fastest cars on the racetrack, and that is Jimmy Horton and Jeff Purvis. Well, you know, the problem with Loy Allen, 
the problem that Bill Venturini's are all running by themselves. Yeah. If they could get hooked up, they might have a chance to run the leaders down, but they're all out there running by themselves and losing ground every lap to this car, the leader, Bob Hill, and also, and most importantly, losing lap to Jeff Purvis and Jimmy Horton, who have already made their pit stops and uh, are set to go, and they're running together. So you've got two good, fast cars that are hooked up together right now. Showing 98 laps complete, so he will have to make an entry onto pit road sometime in the next six to seven laps. Kyle Petty said that they had that crew had borrowed Bob Jenkins' calculator and figured they had to stop sometime around lap 105. So that's only about six laps away. And wonder how bad that these two cars, those blue cars in front of him, would like to see a caution right now. They put him on the lead lap. But uh, and and of course I'm sure that the Hill would like to see a caution too because he knows. <laughs> And he's losing a lot of ground to Horton and Burton. They gained about three seconds in the last three or four laps on it. There's that Bob Bree back in the car number 34, who was the 1990 Series champion. He finished third here last year in this race in Talladega. The Blue Roll 500. Peter Gibbons is your inventing say behind him from Stouffville, Ontario. Just moved to Mooresville, North Carolina. Built a shop down there. He's in the car number 92. And let's show our second and third place cars that are coming in. As Ned Jarrett mentioned, Jimmy Horton, the AC Delco car, 52, that won at Daytona with purpose behind him in the car number one. That black car, Mark Stahl, is a lap down to these guys. In fact, he's being shown two laps down, uh, being in 15th position. He was a lap down. Apparently, when our leader has to make an entry on the pit road, these will be the two cars will be battling up front. They currently are second and third. Horton and Purvis. Era Chevrolet. told that Jimmy Horton actually has gone to work for Kenny Strader in the shops in Concord. In fact, I'm told Kenny Cohut, the crew, the crew chief for Strader, prepares all these different kinds of race cars. Maybe the most talented man in racing because he can prepare a car for anything. Winston Cup, Bush, Sprint cars, midgets, whatever. They built a short track car, and Jimmy Horton is going to take the short track car to Pensacola next week and run the ARCA race there. Yes, he told me last night he was going to do that. And I guess uh, Kenny Strader is going up to run in the Bush race at the New Hampshire International Speedway out of the Schrader stables. He told me they got like 17 or 18 race cars down there in the Schrader they race. They got everything from go-karts to sprint cars to Winston Cup cars. And remember, Kenny Schrader will field the car in the Brickyard for Gary Bettenhausen. Or you'll be able to see Gary B running for brother Tony Bettenhausen later on the uh, in the month of May as he tries to qualify for the Indianapolis 500. Here's the old two car, Frank Kimmel. That puts him two laps down. After he made that pit stop, he was speeding down Bend Road, had to come back in, and he's now two laps down on these cars. And gentlemen, at the rate these two cars right here are running second and third place cars, the way that they're gaining on Bob Hill right now, even if he didn't have to stop, they're just running down the way that they've been going for the last 10 laps and passed him anyway. 102 laps complete, 117 make up this race. And we might mention to you, of course, that uh, for those of you who are tuning in to see Speed Week, we are enjoying live racing action from Talladega, Alabama, the world's fastest stock car facility, enjoying great ARCA action, the Food World 500. Flying the flag coach and the Winston Select 500. Ernie Urban on the pole. Uh oh, here he comes. He's coming down Pitt Road. He's our leader. Now, Fetty, he's going to be coming to you just in a second, buddy. The 46 car says they're going to come in. They just need a splash of gas. They say they only need four or five gallons of gas. What they plan on doing is stopping the car. The, pit guy, the gas man is going to run along with the cars that come in. He's come to a complete stop. The gas can's in. They're playing the windshield. The gas can's out. Man. They're gone. These guys are still going to be behind, though, Ned. Yeah, they're going to be behind, Kyle, but that was a very good pit stop. That's going to get him a good finish if he don't speed down pit road. He's got to be careful about that now. Watch his don't, speed. Don't, don't speed down pit road. I think he's going to be like, you know, just looking at himself, but I'm not going to 
NASCAR, I mean the ARCA official. Pretty good call from Mark Ludwig, the crew chief on that car, owned by Larry Clement. Bob Hill, we're talking about, he's in the upper part of your screen. He just pitted and was our leader. His lap's now 14 to go, and they're going to be chasing these two cars right here. Horton in the car 52 and Purvis in the car number one. The laps are winding down at Talladega. We'll see if Jimmy Horton can hang on and get his third career victory at this racetrack when we come back. What began on a beach in Daytona more than 50 years ago has become America's most popular spectator sport, NASCAR Winston Cup Racing. Now see how it all got started in this thrilling home video. From Thunder Road to Victory Lane, the NASCAR story is the first of a four-volume set and a must for every fan. To order, call 1-800-764-5441 or send $19.98 plus $4 shipping and handling to the address shown on your screen. Visa and MasterCard accepted. Today's Speed World coverage being brought to you by Quaker State, the intelligent oil for longer engine life. And by the clean machine from Coleman Powermate. Laps winding down. It'll be just 11 laps, make it 10 to go next time by for these two drivers. Jimmy Horton in the AC Delta car, with Kenny Schrader on Chevrolet, and Jane Finch's car. Car number one being driven by Jeff Purvis. It looks like that Horton's car is still handling well right on the bottom of the racetrack. As they come off the corner directly towards us. They have themselves a very good lead over the third place car. And we say that last lap they ran even faster than Purvis did in qualifying. 192.7 miles per hour and Purvis ran 192.5. The effects of the draft. What a difference. We saw some of the Whistling Cup cars running laps over 194 in practice early today in the draft, and what Ernie Irvin qualified for that race at 100, a little over 193.2. Speaking of the Whistling Cup cars, I will tell you, let me quickly run down qualifiers for today. I guess you read the qualifiers yesterday, folks. Today it was Terry Labonte, Dave Marcus, Jeff Bodine, Jeremy Mayfield, Rick Mass to the 25th, Hutch Strickland, Kyle Petty, Brett Bodine, Jimmy Hensley, Bill Elliott is 30th. Derek Cope, Jeff Purvis, Ricky Rudd, Jeff Burton, Walter Dallas, John Andretti, Joe Nemechek, Dick Trickle, Bobby Hamilton, and Jeff Gordon will start 40. The two provisionals, Bobby Labonte and Kirk Shelmerdine, will make his first Winston Cup event race tomorrow. Bobby Bowser, fourth place car, and it looks like he's gaining on Allen, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He was about three and a half seconds behind him now, Benny, and he's cut it down under two seconds. Don't know if he has enough time to catch Loy or not, but he's working on it. That's a differential. Loy Allen, the car number two, the Hooters Sport Thunderbird, left side of your screen. Now coming in the car number 21. And Bobby Boucher, and they're chasing the lead cars. These two right here with nine laps to go. They come through the tribal area. It'll be eight this time by Jimmy Horton. Did not have a ride in Daytona. In fact, he was a spotter for Mike Wallace as now he gets a little bit of a challenge. Horton now fields it off and holds the front spot. Well, ben, Bill Venturini just passed Bob Hill for the fifth spot. Now, remember, Venturini took on four tires, and they're far behind these two guys who are running first and second. Well, now Hill takes those back yep. behind. There it is. That's the battle. That is for six and seven. Hill in the red car. Challenge up front, Purvis trying to look to the inside, and Jimmy Horton's car handling so well, he hugs the bottom of the racetrack. He had about a half a groove, and Purvis thought about sneaking a peek, couldn't quite get it in there. Looks like Purvis might have a little more power than Jimmy Horton, but Horton's car, as Jerry said, is handling very, very well. Winding down, Big Benny, you mentioned the starting lineup for tomorrow's race. You might mention the cars who did not qualify. Richie Petty, Jim Sauter, Rich Bickle did not make the starting lineup. Jimmy Horton, who has a good chance of winning this race today, did not make it in the Hover Motorsports board. He was at Ronnie Sanders, Ward Burton, Ward Gilman, Coward. Those are the cars that did not make the qualifying field for the Winston Select 500 tomorrow. And Horton uh, might have a good Saturday hoping to be able to race both days. Didn't quite get qualified for the Winston Cupper, but he's got a good shot at winning it today if he can hold off the car number one of Jeff Purvis. 
Oh, we've got a crash. Jerry Glanville, coach, is fun coming off turn four, and maybe this thing, caution, is out. Boy, I think we've got ourselves a race now. Oh, yeah. We still got the cars in the lead lap, so they'll all get to bunch up. There's Purvis, but they take the caution flag, and he was trying. There's the pace car trying to pull on. That's what's left of the car number 81 of Jerry Glanville, his first ARCA start. He was back in 21st spot being shown four laps down. Had done a pretty good job today. He had done a good job. Well, he's done a good job because we hadn't seen him on screen. If he'd have done something stupid, <laughs> we'd have been pointed out all day long. And you talk about a layoff. We mentioned in front of the show the drivers in this series have not raced since uh, Daytona on February 13th. He had not been in a car to race, actually in a race since last July. He tried to qualify in a bush cart hickory, didn't make the field. Here once again is what happened to Coach Glenn and Gary Glenn. Well, uh, there he is down on the inside. He's good question. Out of control. He was running in the in the front of a pack of cars there. She slid down on the inside into that embankment on the inside of the track. Ooh, tell you what. Some pretty heavy damage to that right rear. Yeah. I hope Elvis wasn't riding with him then. You know, he's yeah. an Elvis Presley fan. Mm -hmm. Ouch. As Coach Glanville uh, scatters a few photographers and some sheet metal down there and took a heck of a lick on that car number 81, the, the BSR Billy Hess. Brand new, it was brand new, we should say, Ford Thunderbird and Ernie Elliott Motor. The crew chief on that car is Steve Barkdahl. And and they maintain that car up at Phil Barkdahl shop. By the way, we want to say hello to Phil Barkdahl, recovering uh, from an illness. Is anybody going to pit? That's the question. Is any, but Ben Torini, he's not running that well. He's the last car on the lead lap. Maybe he should go in and get four tires. He chooses not to do that. As they work to get Jerry Glanville out of the car, now he steps out of the race car, bringing out this caution flag. We'll be back with more from Talladega Super Speedway after this. at Talladega Super Speedway working the fifth caution flag today moments ago when the car number 81 of Jerry Glanville 52 year old former Atlanta Falcons coach tagged the wall and the field now showing one lap to go to green Jimmy Horton Jeff Purvis Loy Allen Bobby Bowsher and Mark Thompson in the top five Bob Hill Bill Venturini Frank Kimmel Gary Bradbury and Peter Gibbons Rounding up the top ten with eight cars being well, shown in the lead lap. Well, Frank Kim was actually right beside the leader, Jerry. Uh, he's on the tail end. There he is beside the leader, Jimmy Orton. So he is uh, on the tail end of the lead lap. Or actually, lap, he's right now a lap down. But I guess we can qualify him on the tail end of the lead lap. And there's Bob Reback. He is uh, being shown two laps down in 11th position. Yeah, you know, I hate to see this. I hate to see these cars double up like this with just a couple of laps to go because like Ben Torini, Bob Hill, those guys are starting back. They're fifth or sixth in the lineup, but they actually start 10th or 12th. It just really hurts their progress towards the front. Well, they'll get the green flag this time. It'll be lap 114, so when they come by for the green, it'll be three to go as there's four laps currently to go. It'll be a three-lap sprint to see if Jimmy Horton Remember, he won those five in a row back in 1990, including a win here at Talladega. Also won here in 1991. Has been without a ride. Had a chance at a Winston Cup ride that went away. And what a talented young man and, and certainly deserving of an opportunity in Winston Cup. And that's why Kenny Schrader wanted to put him in this car, to let Jimmy Horton showcase his talent on the super speedways, hoping maybe someone will give this young man a chance at a very valuable Winston Cup career. Ned, does the NASCAR rule they, in Daytona, they talked about not doubling up with 10 laps to go. Is that still a rule? Yeah, of course I know. But they're doubling up here in Arca. Orton Purvis, Loy Allen, the car number two. Behind him, Bobby Bowser coming from a lap down. Then comes Mark Thompson. Great run for Thompson today after that spectacular spill and flip at Daytona. There's Horton's crew, Timmy Kohut and company. And they can go to victory lane in about three laps from now. Coming up to speed, green flag. It'll be a sprint race, lap 115. Horton got off to a good start. Boy, Allen and Purvis racing together. If Allen gets alongside, they can. 
gives his race goodbye. Boy, Horton has jumped in the throttle of that car number 52. Now tries to bring the car down and break the draft. There's a battle back there. Frank Kimmel, the 02, and Bobby Bousher in the car number 21 with, with Mark Thompson in the 66 right behind them. And Bouncer Kimmel for it, Kimmel. Kimmel is a lap down to these cars. position on the lead lap. That's for six spots. Hill gets it. Meanwhile, back to the lead. Here we go. Hurts on the outside takes the lead as a white flag. No, two more laps to go. I thought it was a white flag. That's two more laps to go. And Purvis put his foot in that Rutt Pittman engine. That's the Morgan McClure Sterling Marlin engine builder. And these guys side by side are going to give Purvis a chance to get away. Oh! Helen is I don't know if there are engineering awards in motorsports, but there should be. And that young man right there is going to be very thankful. And this probably will come away. Here is a caution flag being waved and the white flag. So caution is white at this time as they come by for the win. Here comes Bowsher and Purvis will take the caution flag and the white flag, but uh, it's not over, fans. Remember what happened in Bristol, Tennessee, and they're already celebrating down in the uh, Jeff Furman Center. It's over. I mean, they get the checkered flag the next time by. Yeah, the Mark Horton didn't make it all the way back. We see that once in a lifetime. This baby is over. Okay, going forward, waving the caution and the white, and Jeff Purvis will take the Delco Remy. Chevrolet Lumina, the victory lane behind the Pontiac safety car. Great run by Purvis. And what about Bobby Bowsher, the car number 21, as Loy Allen climbs out of the Hooters Ford. Evidently, there was contact between Loy Allen and the 52 car of Jimmy Horton. Let's take a look and see. We see the two, the two car on the outside, Jimmy Horton, and Horton goes up. Did Bowser get the back of the car? I don't know. It, uh... I don't know. It's hard to say which one of those cars. Somebody touched him, I think, as he came right there. But look at those flaps. Really do their job. Put the car back down on the ground. Then as it spun around again, here they come up again. I tell you, what a job. you got to give a call to the NASCAR people who... Look, there's a there's a dent in the back of the car. Looks like he got a little bit of uh, maybe some sheet metal damage before he even hit the wall. But those flaps up on that car kept that car on the ground. It started to lift. The flaps put it back on the ground. They, they, they're stall flaps to stall the air coming across the top of the car so it'll stay on the ground. That's indeed what it did. And fortunately, Loy Allen able to walk away. But this car right here will be headed to victory lane. The Delco Remy X1R friction proofing Chevrolet. Jeff Purvis, they're standing on pit road. Mark Reno, congratulations. Mark Reno, the crew chief down there. Jeff Purvis, and what a job they have done. Now they go up beside of him and congratulate Jeff Purvis on winning the race there, Mark Thompson does. That's what they did to Mark Martin in Bristol, but they did it on the white flag lap rather than the checkered flag lap. I tell you, it's, and somewhat of a victory for, for Mark Thompson, who finishes in third today after that spectacular spill at Daytona. Here again is what happened. Well, this is with a camera on top of the roof, and we really can't see what initiated the contact between Loy Allen and Jimmy Horton. Yeah, I think Horton is the car that maybe it made contact with, with Allen's car. Different angle once again. We'll show you with two laps to go coming at you out of turn two. The cars are just, the cars are just so far apart, and all of a sudden they just go together. I, I can't tell if Loy Allen came down the racetrack or Horton went up. Hard to say exactly what happened. I don't know. Hard to say, but got to believe you talk about a testimonial for those flaps. I said, I don't know if there's an engineering uh, award for motorsports, but it should go to whoever developed those flaps, as certainly they have done their job repeatedly at Daytona. And as Ned, you mentioned, the, it came out in a bulletin this week that those flaps will be required on every car in NASCAR racing on tracks of a mile or longer. That's starting in August. We'll be back to talk to our winner here of the Food World 500. As they head to Victory Lane, we'll talk with Jeff Purvis in just a moment.
Back at Talladega, Alabama, getting a nice cold drink. It is a warm afternoon here in at Talladega. We told you there were some thunderstorms in the area. They have not materialized. Beautiful skies here. Temperatures over 80 degrees. And Jeff Purvis takes the victory. The 12th annual Food World 500. He will get the lion's share of $172,345 purse in that James Finch owned Chevrolet. circle interview coming up right now let's go down to john turner john well i see you got the little neck thing here you got the right hat on there congratulations on a fine victory all right man that was a rough one right there wasn't it uh we were bad it must be a day for dirt track racers i i saw kenzer won that one earlier and then we won this one today and horton's up there running pretty good so we uh the dirt track the dirt track fans ought to be happy right now talk about the move of uh, the winning move that you made the winning move i was having trouble getting anybody to go with me i was uh you know, we battled there a little bit earlier, and I don't think the two car wanted to go with me, and I just had to fall back and get a run in Horton and try to draft on Bang. Yeah, you're in the race for tomorrow. How much does this help you? Well, that's got to help a lot. I mean, we found out what the tires like, what the chassis likes, and, you know, there's a lot of things that's got to help right here, but, uh, you know, this Delco Remy Chevrolet just really came through. I mean, they built this car in about a week and a half, and it stayed together. I mean, that says a lot with the Phoenix Racing Crew. You've won Daytona, but I don't think you've won here at Talladega. How big a win is this? Oh, this is a big one. I mean, we really wanted to come here and run good. We want to run good tomorrow also, but, you know, Delco Remy's sitting there, and they're, you know, they're sponsoring us for six races, and, you know, we try to run good for them, and uh, we just wanted a good outing and wanted to come home a winner. You know, guys, he looks really calm, but take my word for it. He's very, very happy, Jerry. Boy, indeed he is, and he should be. What a great run today, and, and he gets a little bit of a, a mini Gatorade shower from down in victory lane. Now, here's what happened two laps ago, Benny and Ned. See if you can figure out what exactly went on. Of course, this is from the blimp. That's Horton down on the inside, and Lloyd Allen up on the outside as they come off of turn two and head down the back stretch. Now, Allen gets on up, gets momentum going, gets out in front of Horton, and here comes Bowser. That's the third car back there in that particular picture. Maybe Allen comes down a little bit, but Horton's car, maybe he might have been trying to get in line out there to try to pick the draft back up of Purvis, who was pulling away at that time, and they just made contact, and around he went. It looked like that, that Loy Allen maybe came down about a foot, and the 52 car of Horton went up a foot, and that's all it took. And here's the low angle once again, looking right at it as they come out of turn two, headed down the back stretch. We try to follow that white line as they come down the line and all of a sudden, it looks like that Lloyd does come down a little bit, and Horton maybe went up a little bit. I, hey, they just made contact, and he really is amazed to see those flaps come up. Jack Roush, I think, was the guy who perfected those flaps, and Jack, a job well done. Indeed, Jack, the engineer, and, and a job well done by our proof positive MCI blimp from high above, giving us those great aerial shots today over this massive 2,000-acre facility here in central Alabama. Talladega Super Speedway. What a great racetrack. We'll have plenty of racing action to come your way tomorrow, and there are those flaps still up after working and doing their job to keep that car on the ground. We'll come back to Talladega Super Speedway and talk more about ARCA and upcoming Winston Cup after this. Stay with us. Back at Talladega Super Speedway, the Food World 500 is history. Victory Lane continues. We might mention, those of you tuning in to watch Speed Week that was going to be on earlier today, this race, this live racing action came to you uh, to try to beat some of the weather here at Talladega. And Speed Week will be on at midnight Pacific, but 3 a.m. Eastern time. So this morning, you can tune in for at 3 a.m. Eastern and catch Bob Jenkins and all the fine folks on Speed Week, which will be on at midnight on Pacific time. Now, let's check in once again down in the pit area with John Kernan. Jerry, I'm with a very happy Bobby Bowser. You guys what, lost a lap early, made it up, and finished second. What a great job. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty happy. I mean, we almost come away with the win, but, you know, give the quality farm fleet for Thunderbird a heck of a ride today. I'll tell you, I run my butt off. I ain't kidding you. <laughs> These races are hard on the brain, now I'm telling you. But, you know, I thought we had a good chance to win the race. You know, we come from a lap down, you know, same thing at Daytona. Man, we was close, I tell you. But that deal on the back stretch, you know, I... Horton just didn't give enough room for me or uh, Loy Allen to get in, but uh, that's what happened to Loy Allen. But 
Man, I'm pretty happy with second place considering, you know, how we qualified and I made a mistake on my part, but you know, we were second place. I'm pretty happy. You know, you guys came down here with four cars because you're not even going back home. You're going directly from here to Pensacola. This has got to make that trip a little bit better, huh? You ain't kidding, I tell you. Especially being away from home, you know, being away from family, it's tough. But you know, I just like to say hi to everybody at home. I'm thinking of you. And hi, Brittany. <laughs> All right, congratulations on a fine finish, Bobby. Jerry? Nickname in the car for his three-and-a-half-year-old daughter, Brittany, did indeed change his luck as he finishes second today behind Purvis with Mark Thompson, Jimmy Horton, and Bill Venturini rounding out the top five. Six through ten, Bob Hill, Frank Kimmel, Gary Bradbury had that lap penalty. Loy Allen in ninth position, and Bob Breback finishes tenth. And 11 through 15, Peter Gibbons, Mark Stahl, Harris Devane, Bobby Gearhart, Craig Rubert, right, finishing in 15th place. 16th through 20th, Wayne Larson, Jay Jensen, Michael Dawkins, and Bob Williams, Jerry Hill. 21st position, Laura Lane, Lois Lane, Tom Lorenz, 22nd, Bob Strait, Kenny Wallace, not Henry, Kenny Wallace, and Alan Pruitt. And 26 through 30, Rob Smith, Gary Weinbrower, Danny Kelly, Jerry Glanville, the coach, 29th, Glenn Brewer, back in 30th. And 31st, John Wilkinson, a young man out of Hueytown, Alabama. Roger Blackstock driving Charlie Newby's number 77 here. Jeff McClure, the 89. L.W. Miller and Ken Allen out of Shelby, North Carolina, finishes 35th. 36, last year's winner, Tim Steele. Bob Shack, Dick Trickle, who led the first lap. Joel White and former series champion Bob Keselowski. Back in 41st was Kerry Teague. And Bobby Coyle had the engine trouble and will get 42nd position. Our current ARCA Supercar Series point standings, we have a tie atop the leaderboard. Bobby Bowsher and Bob Hill are tied for first. Our winner, Jeff Purvis, back in third spot. Former two-time series champion, Bill Venturini, and now Savannah, Georgia resident, Mark Stahl, are tied for fourth spot. 